70% of Americans today live paycheck to paycheck. We consistently spend more than we make. Easy and available credit may be the culprit. Learn some tips that will save you a lot of money and headaches. Next on Living Smart. Hello, I'm Patricia Gross. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Today's guest financial advisor, Manisha Takor, recently co-authored a book to teach women about personal finance. Manisha realized that even with an MBA from Harvard, she hadn't learned much about basic financial literacy. Today, she'll teach us how to save, invest, avoid the perils of credit card debt, and create a budget you can live with. Travel, culture, and a great education. She's just in her 30s, but Manisha Takor is already reaching her dream of success and prosperity. And she credits her parents for what they taught her as a child. My mom raised me on feminist books like Free to Be, You and Me, and Gender Neutral Toys. And my dad is brilliant in finance, and at a young age, he taught me about the power of compounding. And the twin forces of my feminist mom and my financial dad um, definitely created uh, who I am today. Today, she works in the financial services industry. She's also the co-author of On My Own Two Feet, which deals with financial literacy for women. It's a personal finance book for people who really aren't that interested in personal finance. Our deepest hope is that we can encourage women to understand that if they own their finances, that they literally can own their lives in the sense that um, they can leave a job that doesn't make them happy. If they're in a relationship where they don't feel supported, they can leave. If, there's, if they have children and there's a passion one of their children wants to pursue, they can use their funds to help uh, their child. As a child, Manisha did not fit in. She was smart, but not especially popular. Kids can be so mean, and you know, I was chubby, and I had Coke bottle glasses, and I had braces, and some of the boys called me cow butt or thunder thighs, and I mean, the mean things that kids can say to you that just really cut to your core and eat your self-esteem. This drove her to the books, and one in particular, A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. Therefore, I would ask you to write all kinds of books, hesitating at no subject, however trivial or however vast. It's been sort of my personal Bible, if you will. Um, she wrote it back in the late 1920s, and her main argument in the book is that in order for a woman to be truly creative, she has to have money and a space of her own. She doesn't need a lot of money, she doesn't need a lot of space, but she needs something that is hers alone. And that really has been my driving force. She was valedictorian of her high school class of 400. In college, she graduated magna cum laude from Wellesley. And it was there where she learned another valuable lesson. One of the activities I did was to volunteer in a shelter for battered women. Um, and every Monday night, I would go there. Just further added fuel to this belief that women have got to have economic power in order to to live their lives to their fullest. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, Manisha is the subject of a radio interview. The first question that comes across is why should it be that the woman needs a different financial advisory counseling? It is particularly important for women because statistically speaking, we're the ones left holding the bag at the end of the day. So believe it or not, 80% of men die married and 80% of women die single. Women also love to shop. So you want to do 10 and then split the rest. OK. A statistic Manisha often mentions is that 70% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. That may have to do with the easy availability of credit. So it's true that most Americans have about 15 credit cards in their billfold. Patty, can you believe it? I mean, this is what the average American's plastic collection looks like. And it, it's crazy for a couple reasons. First of all, with this many credit cards, nobody, no matter how hard you try, can keep track of what you're spending. But the even bigger reason not to do it is if you're only making the minimum monthly payment on your credit cards, you have effectively doubled the purchase price of whatever it is you charge to your card. Credit cards are not free money. 
Manisha, now happily married, also reminds her readers that life is not all about money. I think the number one lesson is that happiness is something that is typically maximized by experiences and not possessions. Um, time with family, time doing hobbies that you love, um, really being in the flow. Next up for Manisha is to reach out to youngsters with her simple financial philosophy. So listen up. Only two credit cards. All right, so you've got your primary, you've got your backup, the best thing you can possibly do is pick up a piece of scissors and these extra credit cards and start snipping away, literally, just like you might do pictures of that boyfriend that got away. It's a very cleansing process. It's a great living smart ritual. Absolutely. Thank you, Manisha Takor, for joining us. Patricia, great to be here. <laughs> that boyfriend that you've got to get rid of. Okay. Um, what, what is the state of financial literacy today in America? It is awful. I mean, as a nation, we are financially obese. I can, I can give you a, a ream of statistics. My absolute favorite is that 70% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, and it cuts across income spectrums. Right. It's not just the poor or the middle class. It's everybody. It is everyone. We could all end up in the street. It is unbelievable how many families driving fancy cars and living in big homes are truly a couple of paychecks away from being in the same predicament as somebody who is struggling with a living wage. How did we end up here? A couple of factors. The first is that personal finance is a subject that's just not generally taught. And on top of that, we in the society talk about everything else, our childhood angst, our sexual predilections, but we don't talk openly and honestly about our money. So people don't admit that they don't understand it. Layered on top of this are two other items. The second is that we're bombarded 24-7 by unrealistic media images. And the third, and this is the real toxic sauce, is that unlike previous generations, today we all have relatively easy access to credit. That was the big downfall for, for society. When did that start and why? Well, it started when um, various rules and regulations changed such that financial institutions could tier the interest rates that they charged. So it used to be interest rates were very tightly regulated, so if you weren't a good credit risk, they weren't going to lend you money. Now, if you're a bad credit risk, they'll happily lend you money because they'll raise interest rates so that they can make a profit off of you. And there are good and bad sides to that. There's been some benefit to the democratic a democratization, if you will, of access to money. But the downside is it's given almost every one of us a bazooka to shoot ourselves in the foot with. <laughs> now, um, you know, later on we'll talk about how to be smart with money, but uh, personal finance, is it more important for you? You wrote for women. Is it more yeah. important for women or men, and why? I'm so glad you asked that question, because a lot of times people say, did you write this book because ladies inherently aren't smart with their money? <gasps> and that how is dare so they not say true. That? My, my best friend and co-author, Sharon Kadar, and I, we wrote this book because, statistically speaking, us ladies are the ones left holding the bag at the end of the day. Okay. You know, we, we've talked about this before, but it, I can't emphasize it enough. Ninety percent of women will find themselves the sole provider of their personal finances at some point in their lives. That's why we need to get on top of it as women. we got to get smart with money. Now, what are some of the common financial mistakes people make? The three biggest that I see are, first, people thinking that everybody else has it figured out, and they're the only ones with questions. So being nervous about asking for mm -hmm. additional information. The second is not understanding the immense power that comes from starting to save and invest early on, even if it's just small amounts. And the third is not understanding how ferociously expensive debt can be, particularly a revolving or credit card type debt. Right, right. It's, it's huge in America today. Now, the subprime mortgage crisis, mm. how did that happen and how do we avoid that in the future as consumers? My personal feeling is that it's a confluence of events um, that brought it about, but the most important one and the one that I feel is not being discussed is the role of financial literacy. In other words, in years past, if you wanted to buy a house, you only had one choice. You had to put 20% down. Period. Period. And you took out a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Now we have all kinds of fancy schmancy options for borrowing money to get a house, adjustable rate mortgages, interest-only mortgages, uh, a option um, only mortgages all kinds of fancy products and as a result today you can buy a house sometimes with almost nothing down 
And that has resulted in many people biting off more house than they can comfortably chew. Mm -hmm. And the way to prevent it going forward, because today's problem is subprime loans. Tomorrow's problem is something we haven't even thought of yet. But if we can get educated about the financial basics, we can defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard that, uh, that it's really smart to teach children about money and that you can start saving 20 bucks a month when you're 18 and you can be a millionaire by the time you're 65. Now, when is it that we are supposed to talk to children and what do we tell them? Some of the things that I think are important to say may sound trite, but they're incredibly powerful. I mean, literally letting your children know that money doesn't grow on trees by showing them, you know, you don't have to open up the entire wallet, but you can say to them, okay, we have got as a family $100 this week to spend on groceries. So come shopping with me and let's see how far that goes. Let them see that there are trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Or this weekend we have $60 as a family to spend on fun. These are the different options. Or we could not spend it this week, save it, and next week have $120. So involving your kids, and you can start that at any age. How old were you when you started saving? Oh, gosh. You know, to be honest, I think I was probably around four or five. Wow. Um, I got an allowance Tight early girl, on. Weren't yeah, you? <laughs> I was frugal from the beginning, from the beginning. But it's paid off. <laughs> now, what do excellent personal finance skills boil, boil down to? The good news is three words save, invest, and protect. Okay. That's it. Very simple. And protect what you save or protect what you invest? I mean, what does that mean? Protect is a very broad phrase, but it really means protect your relationship with your money because mm -hmm. money is freedom. And so I use that phrase to um, identify a couple of different areas in life. One is your financial reputation particularly your credit score. Another is the way you relate to money when you couple up with that someone special. Mm -hmm. That's very important to talk about money when you're coupling, right? Very, <laughs> very important very to have that conversation. Now, the three most important expenses in life I hear are, is your home, your car, and sometimes a funeral, right? How much do you know how much you should spend? Let's say I want to buy a home, but I make, I don't know, 30, 40, 50. I mean, how do you know how much home yeah. you can buy, how much car you can yeah. buy, how much funeral you can pay for? So these are interesting questions, and one thing I'll tell you is, again, my co-author and I were both Harvard MBAs, and we literally spent months researching this question. It's not easy to get a crisp answer. Here's our answer to that question. We think combined, your housing and transportation costs should be no more than 35% of your gross income. Interesting. And so some rough rules of thumb, rough rules of thumb, are that for the average person, if you're going to put 20% down on your home, that means you can afford a home that's somewhere between three and three and a half times your household annual income. And for a car, it means you can buy a car that is somewhere between 30 and 50% of your annual income, again, if you're putting 20% of the down payment. Okay, well, that's a, good, that's a good thing to know. Now, when you go shopping, is there questions you need to ask yourself? Because we live in a consumer society, and we are bombarded with advertising, sale, 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 and you go, I really want to go on the sale, because, you know, you already have that piece of clothes or whatever. How, what are some of the questions you need to think about before you go shopping? To me, the number one question is, how bad do I want it? Okay. And this actually is a, a, a quantitative tool as well as a qualitative tool. And the way it becomes a quantitative tool is to relate your income to an hourly after-tax wage. Rough rule of thumb, if you make $40,000 a year, for the average person, taxes chew up a quarter of that. You're taking home $30,000 a year. Most of us work 50 weeks a year, uh, 40 hours a week. That's 2,000 hours. So you divide the $30,000 by 2,000 hours, you're making $15 an hour. Hmm. Now you go out, you see a $150 pair of fancy schmancy jeans that you've got to have. Wait, $150 jeans, I make $15 an hour after taxes. That's 10, 10 hours. hours. To buy, 10 hours to buy a jean. <laughs> do I really want it? Now you might. Right. But that gives you a tool. How bad do you want it? That gives you a tool to answer the question. It gives you an understanding. Now, what is the first step toward getting financial literate? Honest to goodness, it's a mindset. And that may sound a little fruity, a little new agey, but it is incredibly important because we've met people that can save money on salaries of $30,000 a year. We've met people who don't have a penny, and I'm not kidding, not a penny in savings on salaries of 300000 or more a year. So it's commitment first, and then 
the confidence to ask questions and learn how to save, invest, and protect. How much should you save? How many, and what should you save? I mean, how much of your salary should you save and when should you start saving? I'm going to answer this straight up. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I get this look from people when I give the number. Um, 15%. That's okay. financial nirvana. Of, of your gross of income. Of your gross income. 15%. And you save for three reasons. For short-term emergency funds, for medium-term needs, such as a down payment on a home or a car, and then for longer-term needs, such as your retirement or helping your children fund education. Mm -hmm. And roughly speaking, of that 15%, 5% goes to the short and medium term needs, 10% towards retirement. Okay. And then you're, you're saving for emergencies as well. Correct. That goes in that short term that's bucket. Short -term. That's the foundation. Are credit cards, you talked about credit cards, mm -hmm. but are they good or bad? Now, that's a tough question to answer because credit cards are an odd animal. They can be your friend or they can be your foe, depending on how you use well, they them. They could be a tiger and a dog, for instance. Exactly, <laughs> literally. I mean, so they're your friend in the sense that they're convenient. They help right. you avoid carrying around wads of cash right. in your pocket, and they're your friend that if you use them responsibly, which means you pay off your bill on time, in full every month, you can help build a good credit score. Is that, do you think, the only way you should have a credit card, when you pay it monthly, automatically? My personal feeling is yes. yes. And that the only other reason you would add something to that credit card that you can't afford to pay for at the end of the month is if it is truly a life or death emergency. Tell me about a credit card score and where you can get your credit report. Sure. So there are two phrases out there that it's important for everyone to know. One is credit report and the other is credit score. Okay. Your credit report is basically like a 24-7 reality TV camera aimed right at your wallet. And it follows you everywhere you go and every transaction you make that involves borrowing money is recorded. And you can find out what is on your credit report by going to a website the government has set up, annualcreditreport.com. And, you and can it's free. free. Everybody can check their credit reports once a year for free. Now your credit report is the information that is used to create your credit score. Mm -hmm. Your credit score is a three-digit number, um, and higher is better, so it's kind of the opposite as your weight. Right. Um, and ideally, you want a credit score uh, that's somewhere north of 700. That's excellent credit. Um, and the average credit score in America right now is around 723, but there's a wide range, and if you're below 700, you really want to work on that. You're in trouble. Now, how about investing? I mean, why can't you just save? I mean, investing for some people is a scary game. It really is, and, and, and let's be honest, it takes a lot of hard work to save, so to have fear about investing, that's a natural emotion. And one of the messages I'm really passionate about getting out there is that while you may think you're playing it safe by just saving and not investing, it's actually a huge risk. And the best analogy I can give you is this. Your money is kind of like your muscles. If it just sits there, it atrophies. So if you put your body in bed and just sat there for 30 years, and then you tried to stand up, you'd fall over. Right. Same thing with your money. With inflation, which is the process by which prices go up, if you have $1,000 today, inflation is 3%, 30 years from now, that $1,000 will only buy as much as $400 does today. Mm -hmm. So the reason you invest is to combat the corrosive power of inflation. And if you do it really well, you can grow your money even faster, build the muscles. Okay, let's say I wanna start investing and I have no idea what to do. What's the first step? The first step is to keep it simple. Okay. A lot of people think, my gosh, if I'm going to invest, I've got to do a deal or find out what's right. the next Google or Microsoft, and you don't need to go there. There's a wonderful financial product out there that I love. It's called a Target Date Retirement Fund. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the financial version of the chicken rotisserie, set it and forget it. It's, it's a mutual fund that you invest in, and it gradually shifts your money between stocks, bonds, and cash to get slowly more conservative over time as you get closer to retirement. One decision investment making. That's easy. Let's talk about mutual funds and stocks. Yeah. When should you invest in mutual funds? When do you go to stocks? So mutual funds are a great option if you're just not that interested in your personal finances. Okay. You want your money to grow, but you don't want to devote a lot of time to really thinking about it. Stocks are something that 
Personally, I feel people should only invest in individual stocks if they're willing to commit 10 to 15 hours a week so you gotta to know researching. What you're doing. You really or have get to put a financial in the time. advisor. Or have an advisor who's committing that amount of time mm -hmm. to researching those stocks. Now, uh, and that leads to my next question. Which stock should you invest in? How do you know? You have to go to a professional. You do. I mean, you either have to really educate yourself um, and... If you're interested in this, uh, on our website, onmyowntwofeet.com, we list what we think are some of the best books out there about investing. To read investing. about investing. Yeah, and, and educate yourself or find a good advisor. But it is always safer anyway if you're starting out to probably invest in mutual funds because they take care of it, right? Tell me about mutual funds. They're, they're investing in different areas, bonds, Mut stocks. Mutual funds are basically like a smoothie, and they come in several different flavors. Broad flavors are stock mutual funds, bond mutual funds, and balanced mutual funds, which include a bit of both. And the neat thing about mutual funds is, and I'll take an example of a broadly diversified uh, stock fund, you own a bunch of different companies. Mm -hmm. So by buying one fund, you're getting a little bit of broccoli, a little bit of carrots, a little bit of beets. You're getting right. a little Procter & Gamble, a little Johnson & Johnson, a little Microsoft. Right. So it's one-stop shopping. Right. It's, it's easier and you don't lose as much. You don't risk as much, but you don't lose as much. Mutual funds are a wonderful keep it simple option. Now, you know, I've heard about CDs and money market funds. If you're going to go, which one should you go for and why? It's an, a really interesting question. Um, a lot of times people say, okay, I've saved money. What do I do next? The first question is to decide when you're going to spend that money. Money that you know you need to spend in the next one to five years, you don't want to invest. What you want to do is protect it against inflation by using an interest-bearing account. And you just named the classic examples. Your options are savings accounts, money market funds or money market accounts, and certificates of deposit. I've listed them um, just now in order of increasing interest rate, generally speaking. Savings accounts, the lowest. CDs, the highest. But I've also listed them in decreasing order of flexibility. Right, because CD, you can't, make, you can't write a check with a CD, and you Ex can't with a money market fund. Exactly, exactly. So there's a trade-off between how easy you can access your money, how easily you can access your money, and what kind of interest rate you can earn. But those are the three basic options. Let's talk about college kids, because that, you know, they mm -hmm. go out there, they go crazy. How do you coach your kid who's going to leave home for the first time and really wants to leave, go far, and spend money? What do you tell them? I think or the, her? the very first thing you tell your child when they head off to school is just say no when it comes to putting money on a credit card that you cannot afford to pay off on time, in full, when the bill comes. What happens is these days, college kids get inundated with offers to open up credit cards and a lot of them don't understand how they work. They don't understand if you make the minimum monthly payment, you've basically doubled the purchase price. That single message alone is invaluable to send your kids off to school with. Now is it true that in America in general in the past, I don't know, 20, 30 years, our homes have gotten bigger, our appliances have gotten bigger, our cars have gotten bigger, and, and we really don't necessarily need to make things bigger, right? It is incredibly true. Our consumptive appetites in America have become supersized, not solely in terms of our stomachs, but also in terms of our possessions. And if you think about it, you know, many people say, my gosh, housing is so unaffordable these days. You know, my mom, she grew up in a house that had one bathroom, and... She hasn't suffered any lingering consequences of having to share that bathroom with her sister and her parents. Mm -hmm. These days, most homes have more bathrooms than occupants. <laughs> it, it's crazy, the things that we think we need. And so as functions that used to be outside the home move inside the home. Right, you told home me about gyms, that. Home gyms, home theaters, houses are getting bigger. But do we really need all of that? It's a good question to think about. People are concerned today about the next couple of years being difficult. We might get into a recession. How do you prepare for something like that? The best way you prepare is making sure that you are balancing your natural desire to enjoy today with the need to save, invest, and protect for tomorrow. The best way to prepare for uncertain times is to live within your means. And for the past five or 10 years, most Americans haven't been doing that. So understand how much you earn, how much you're spending, making sure you're saving, and that you've got a cash cushion. Those are the best things that you can do to prepare for uncertain times. Is that what you do? 
Absolutely. You're still doing that. Absolutely. I mean, you still make a lot of money, but you're still living like you lived when you were a teenager. Because I, I, it's a mindset it's that It's a you mindset. Said. It's a mindset. I mean, I firmly believe that, um, I hope this never happens, but if my home were to burn down and I were to lose all my possessions, I'd like to be the same person I am with stuff or without stuff. Right. So that's very important to do. How do you know you're living smart? I know I'm living smart when I feel like I'm living my position, my life from a position of financial strength, when money is an enabler, when it enables me to help people pursue their dreams and passions. I know I'm living smart when I feel that I can make a difference in the world and take knowledge that I have and use it to make mankind happier, healthier, and, and just more joyful. Do you plan to write a book for men as well? Well, I'd like to take the Fifth Amendment on that one. <laughs> Thank you so much. And to learn more about this topic, go to our website, HoustonPBS.org slash Living Smart. There you'll also find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713-743-8513. And that's our show for today. I hope you get smarter with your money, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember, don't forget to live smart with your money. I'm Patricia Gross. Have an abundant, healthy week. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.